Hello, and welcome to our webinar, Egypt to the Land of the Pharaohs. My name is Desiree Shah, and I'm the Program and Marketing Assistant here at Times Journeys. During this webinar, you'll learn about our eight-day journey, which includes a cruise on the Nile. New York Times experts will help you piece together the life and times of a mighty ancient civilization and share the vision for the country's future. We're here today with David Kirkpatrick, the former New York Times Cairo Bureau Chief, and Rami Gurgis, Product Manager in the Private Jet and Special Interest Travel Departments at Abercrombie & Kent. So before we begin, why travel with the New York Times? Uh, first of all, each of our small group tours and cruises travels with a Times journalist or subject matter expert. In addition to formal talks and Q&A sessions, your experts are there to lend their unique perspective to your trip. Their informative lectures are specifically designed to educate and inspire you and to bring to life the remarkable civilizations and cultures of the regions you visit. We offer over 40 itineraries for our group, small group tours and cruises, and you can journey with us to destinations as diverse as Kashmir, Ethiopia, or Provence, exploring everything from history to culture to politics. Lastly, when you take a Times Journeys, you can escape the crowds with tours that include after hours entrance to museums and access to attractions normally closed to the public. So we'll go into the itinerary in more detail later on, but first I'd like to take you through a brief overview of the journey. So your tour begins when you arrive in Cairo, where you'll stay for two days. On day three, fly to Abu Simbel, after exploring the cultural and historical sites, fly to Aswan and transfer to your Nile cruise ship, Sanctuary Sunboat 4. On day four, you'll take a short boat ride to the island of Agilica and then sail to Edfu. You'll end the day docked in Esna. Day five and six are spent in Luxor and your last two days are spent back in Cairo exploring the city before flying home. Um, so during this tour, you'll gain insight with special talks and exclusive access to experts and experiences to help you put this enigmatic nation into perspective. Here are a few of the incredible things you'll do and see. You'll go inside one of the pyramids of Giza and get a sense of how they were built and learn about their history. Visit the Temple of Philae, a UNESCO World Heritage Site, and one of the last strongholds of the ancient Egyptian religion. Take part in a cooking lesson from your onboard chef on the Sanctuary Sunboat. With an Egyptologist, take a tour of the East Bank of Luxor, including a visit to the Temple of Luxor, where you'll meet with an archaeologist for an update on the latest discoveries. Join a special guest speaker during a cocktail reception to talk about the country's recent history and Egypt's vision for the future. So now I'd like to introduce you to your expert on this tour, David Kirkpatrick. David was the New York Times Bureau Chief in Cairo from the beginning of 2011 through the end of 2015. He covered the Arab Spring uprisings in Egypt, Tunisia, and Libya, and has also written for the Times from Syria, Iraq, Lebanon, Bahrain, Saudi Arabia, and Jordan. He has been a reporter for the Times since 2000, and he was a Washington correspondent before moving to Cairo. He's the author of Into the Hands of the Soldiers, Freedom and Chaos in Egypt and the Middle East, published in August 2018. Thank you so much for joining us today, David. Um, and I'll just hand it over to, to you to talk a little bit about your experience. Thank you. Uh, I'm, I'm really looking forward to this trip. I did a, a, a journey very similar to this uh, with my wife's family a few years ago at the, at the end of 2014. And a, we remember it as, as one of the greatest vacations we've ever had. It, it, what's amazing about visiting Egypt, or one of the things that's amazing about visiting, visiting Egypt, is it's like two trips in one. On the one hand, you're going back to the land of the pharaohs, the cradle of civilization, the mother of the world, as Egyptians like to call it, where really it all began, meaning all recorded human history. And at the same time, you're traveling to the center of the Arab and Islamic world today. Uh, a country that is the home to one in four Arabic speakers, the place that's been the center of virtually every every major trend in 
So e- Egypt, Egypt has been the center of virtually every major trend in Arab culture and politics for more than half a century. It's still the, the big time and the bellwether wherever you go in the region. Um, I had the luck. I had the luck to arrive uh, in Egypt in 2010, just in time for the Arab Spring Revolt, and uh, which in the end was both born and died in Cairo. And it was a time when all of the society and its politics were sort of turned upside down and inside out. And it was a rare opportunity to understand many of the forces uh, still at work in Egypt today. Different competing Islamist movements burst to the surface and came into light for the first time. The machinery of the state and the security services and politics was revealed in a new way. But also things like the women's movement, which had been more or less taken over and co-opted by the state kind of flowered uh, in public view in a new way. And the Coptic Church went through its own uh, wrenching external challenges, but also some interesting internal divisions that had been hidden in the past, you know, came came to the surface and and were newly visible, you know, between the between the older generations and younger generations or between the laity uh, and the clergy. Uh, Egypt is also a uniquely important country to the United States, as I'm sure you know, in part because of its proximity to Israel. Uh, It's one of the biggest recipients of American aid uh, around the world. Uh, And when I wrote my book about Egypt, I went back and did a lot of reporting about that relationship and about how Washington saw the events in Egypt. And if you're interested, I can can talk about that as well. Uh, Funnily enough, it made me love Egypt even more uh, and admire Egyptians even more and feel really more optimistic about Egypt and its future. The old saying there is that whoever drinks the water of the Nile will always return. And I, uh, I would bet that you will share that view uh, after the trip. So we are also joined today uh, by Rami Gerges, who is here with us from our tour operator for this journey, Abercrombie and Kent. Rami was born in Cairo, Egypt, to Coptic parents and earned his BA in Egyptology and tourism at Suez Canal University. In 2005, Rami came to work for Abercrombie and Kent, handling ANK's North Africa and Middle East tours. In 2013, he was recognized by Condé Nast Traveler magazine as a top travel specialist for Egypt. Rami was promoted to a new position as a product manager in the private jet and special interest travel department. He focuses on developing and growing the Asia product and planning itineraries around the world that include exclusive invitation-only events paired with authentic meals. Rami, thank you for joining us. Thank you very much, Desiree. It's uh, very exciting to... uh, uh, I'm going to start with... um, uh, the, the itinerary, the day-to-day itinerary of the trip. Uh, on day one, uh, we arrive in Cairo, and the arrival, um, uh, the airport is um, very easy to navigate. Uh, it's uh, very modern, um, and getting a visa for Egypt is the easiest thing. You have a couple of options. You can either get, get, get it in advance, an e-visa. There's a web link that you click on. If you pay in advance, uh, the current visa fee is $25 or you can get it on arrival. Um, or of course, you can get it through the embassy. Uh, the fee does not change, the $25 uh, consulate fee does not change. Um, and uh, we'll have someone to uh, inside the airport prior to uh, reaching immigration to uh, uh, with a sign to welcome you and help you through immigration, uh, help you with through customs, take your bag off and you go to the hotel. Um, and a most flight, to Egypt, arrive late in the evening, so there are no activities on this day. Uh, we'll just uh, get to the hotel, get some rest, and uh, get started for the next day's adventure. Uh, we start the next day. Um, we start the next day by going to uh, the pyramids of Giza. Now we've all heard of the pyramids. It's a, uh, it's it's an, it's mind-boggling to go and see these uh, uh, massive monuments. Um, the Great Pyramid of Khufu alone, King Khufu, is uh, uh, it was built using 2,600,000 blocks of stone. Um, and just learning about how they were built um, is um, is fascinating. To hear the guide, you will have an Egyptologist taking you throughout your trip. Um, and he will um, unveil um, all the secrets that he knows and he learned about um, in school and in the field. Uh, many of these guys have also worked in the archaeology field. Um, so they're very well versed in Egyptian history and archaeology. Uh, not only you will learn 
how they built the pyramids, but who built the pyramids, because everyone thinks that the pyramids were built by slaves, when as a matter of fact, they were workers that worked for the king, they loved the king, and it was an honor for them to work for the king. They had specific hours to work, shifts, uh, they had breaks, um, so, and they were rewarded um, every day. So the, the, all of these stories you learn about, not just to go and visit the pyramids and take a picture next to the pyramid. Uh, from the pyramids, uh, we will, after we tour around, around the pyramids, we will go into the three pyramids. Um, um, on the outside, but on the inside, there's really nothing inside. They're just empty, long corridors that lead to large burial chamber. Um, but it's uh, just the, um, the experience of going inside the pyramid is um, it's something, for sure. Uh, for, after the pyramids, we go down to the Sphinx. After the Sphinx, we uh, go have lunch. Uh, we, uh, our local restaurant that we use is right across from the Sphinx area. In fact, from the restaurant, you can get a view. You can see the Sphinx from the restaurant. Uh, great view and uh, great authentic food. Um, after, the, after the pyramids and lunch, we go to visit the Egyptian Museum. Um, the Egyptian Museum is home to thousands and thousands of Egyptian artifacts, a uh, great repository of uh, um, objects. Everywhere you go, uh, there are monuments, and of course, the treasures of Tutankhamun are housed in the museum. Um, we go back to the hotel, uh, get some rest, and in the evening, we'll have a special guest uh, who will join us. Um, a fascinating lady uh, who was a professor of political science and political sociology at the American University in Cairo, a Harvard graduate, and also served for some time in the Egyptian parliament. Uh, she writes regularly for newspapers. Too. She's very well known in Egypt, a celebrity uh, in Egypt. And um, she talks uh, for about half an hour about the current state of affairs uh, and also about uh, women in Egypt. Uh, which is a really interesting topic, uh, uh, but she leaves the floor uh, for an interactive session with all the guests to ask her as many questions as they like. Um, later on, she joins us for a cocktail reception. Uh, so we'll have a drink with her uh, and followed by dinner. Then we get some rest for uh, our early morning the next day. So the next day, we fly to Abu Simbel. Uh, flights in Egypt operate early. Um, very early morning, again, because it gets very hot during the day, uh, so you beat the heat by starting early. And we're, the farther south you go, the warmer it gets. It gets warmer when you go south. Temperature goes up by about 20 degrees or so, but it also gets dry. Um, south Abu Simbel is about two and a half hours flight from Cairo, and what you go visit in Abu Simbel are two temples. There's a temple of Ramses II and the temple of his wife that we see its picture uh, now on the slide, uh, that's the temple of Queen Nefertari, his wife. Um, the uh, the temple of Ramses II, the, the great temple, um, has four statues uh, measuring 64 uh, feet high. Uh, the temple was built so that the rays of the sun would penetrate the temple, go through the temple, all the way to the sanctuary inside the temple, or the Holy of Holies, and shine on the face of Ramses. There are four statues inside this uh, sanctuary sitting side by side, and the sun just shines on the face of Ramses twice a year, on his birthday and on his coronation day. If this is not fascinating enough, the temple was threatened by the high levels of water in the Nile after they built the high dam. So they had to disassemble the temple and raise it up the hillside uh, and put it at a higher level. And when they rebuilt it, they positioned it at the very same angle that it was built thousands of years ago. So the, still, the sun still shines on Ramses' face on his coronation day and on his birthday. Um, amazing sight to see. It really is. We visit for about two hours at uh, the two temples. Uh, and then we take a short flight, half an hour, to Aswan. And Aswan is the home of um, our cruise ship. That's where we uh, board the Sanctuary Sambol 4. Uh, Sanctuary Sambol 4 is a very small ship, uh, only 40 cabins compared to the larger ships uh, that are on the Nile, 50 and 60 cabins. Uh, so it's definitely an intimate um, a boutique experience, um, a, a wonderful cruise ship. Um, as soon as we arrive in Aswan, we'll go out to visit um, a granite quarry. And you may think, oh, a granite quarry? What am I going to see in a granite quarry? 
um, it's actually fascinating because in the granite quarry, they discovered um, an obelisk, an unfinished obelisk uh, that was abandoned on site by the ancient Egyptians. So when you go and you see the actual obelisk still in the quarry, you learn how they cut these uh, stones out of the quarry and why they abandoned uh, the obelisk. Uh, they, they abandoned it because they found a crack in it and it had to be one block of stone. But you also learn how they transported these um, obelisks 1,200 tons each um, to the River Nile and on barges up to all these beautiful temples that we're going to visit later on. So a great uh, eye-opening um, talk to the unfinished obelisk. We go to our cruise ship and uh, we uh, we have a dinner in the evening. Um, also, our dinner there will be accompanied by uh, a Nubian show. The next day, we will go. Uh, we should before we go through the day. Uh, this is a picture of the sun deck on Sunboat 4. Um, the Sunboat 4 um, has um, different categories of cabins. Uh, the Nile deck cabin is the um, entry level, uh, the uh, floor level, and then you go up um, main deck, bridge deck, and promenade deck. Uh, the windows, starting with the main deck, are floor to ceiling. Uh, you get great views of the Nile. All the cabins are air conditioned with individual thermostats. Uh, the service, the food on the boat are um, uh, exceptional. So what do we do on this day? We go out and visit an island called the Island of Majelica. Island of Majelica is home to a temple called the Temple of Phila. Uh, this was the last temple to be built in Egypt, the last pagan structure to be built in the country. Prior to, uh, right after that, Christianity was introduced. Uh, so this period of chaos in Egypt of uh, paganism and Christianity, uh, when Christianity was introduced by St. Mark the Apostle, um, a lot of... Uh, a lot of Egyptians uh, that converted to Christianity had to go hide uh, from um, from the pagans, if you will. So they would go to hide in some of those temples, uh, and they converted some of those temples into monasteries and churches. So you will see when you go to Fila, for example, there is a section that was converted into an ancient Coptic Christian church, and there's an altar and a crucifix uh, carved on the walls. So also when you go, you see the transformation of the ancient Egyptian temple to a church uh, because the structure was taken from the ancient Egyptian temples, um, which also transferred into the Jewish synagogues and then the, the, the Coptic churches and then the churches around the world and mosques. Uh, so it really is um, fascinating to see. Uh, we go back to the boat and uh, we go uh, sail for two and a half hours to Kom Ombo. And that's what we call gold. Kom in um, Arabic means uh, hill or mount. And uh, um, ombo is derived from the ancient Egyptian word nebu, which means gold. So Kom Ombo, hill of gold. What we go visit there is the temple of Komombo, uh, the beautiful temple that was uh, designed into um, in a very unique way so that it encompasses two temples in one. One is dedicated to a god called Hor who was a falcon god, and uh, the other god is called Sobek, who was a crocodile god. And while on site, and after we visit the temple, we stop at a small museum right next to the temple that houses uh, mummified crocodiles. Uh, from there, we continue on to Edfu. Uh, and in Edfu, we take a horse and carriage ride, and we go out to visit the temple of Edfu. The temple of Edfu is uh, the best preserved temple in Egypt. Um, it is um, in excellent, immaculate condition. Um, and uh, it, we spent about two hours in the temple. Uh, it was built, it took about 300 years to build the structure. Uh, so you can imagine how um, how beautiful it is um, and how many buildings you're going to see, um, statues and columns. Uh, fascinating. Um, and then we go back to the boat and we continue on our sailing to Esna, uh, where we dock for the night. Uh, the next day um, is um, a very special day. Um, Luxor is home to uh, many and many and many monuments. Uh, we've all learned in school that uh, in ancient Egypt, they believed they took advantage of uh, uh, the, the, the fact that the sun uh, rises on the east and sets on the west. So the ancient Egyptians took that to heart and practice. They built the city of life. Uh, all their homes on the east bank of the Nile and all their tombs on the west bank. And that would explain the pyramids are actually on the west bank of the Nile. All the tombs that we're going to visit, uh, the Valley of the Kings and even the um, 
the mortuary temples are all built on the west bank, whereas on the east bank we have uh, uh, sun temples or uh, living temples for people to go in and present their offerings. So um, on the east bank of the Nile, we go out to visit the temple of Karnak. The temple of Karnak uh, uh, is 64 acres of land, um, thousands of small chapels and temples. It's mind-boggling to go and visit. Um, and we spend some time there, and then we go out from the temple and see the Avenue of Sphinxes. The Avenue of Sphinxes is, just as the title suggests, it's an avenue that's lined up with Sphinxes, Sphinxes uh, uh, the, body, the body of a lion uh, and the face of a, a man um, or a ram, depending on which statue. It's a two-mile <laughs> A two mile stretch between the two temples. We don't walk the two miles, but we get a feel of it. And the Avenue of Sphinx was used back then for ceremonies uh, to carry the barge of the king from one temple to the other. A great ceremony with dancers, um, dancers, musicians, and the king himself. Now, what's beautiful about ancient Egypt is they documented everything. So, in the Temple of Luxor, which we go visit after Karnak, we will see the Achit festival, that's what it was called, and we see it portrayed on the wall. So everything that the guy tells you, you will see it on the walls themselves. Uh, the Temple of Luxor is one of the most beautiful temples, two uh, beautiful temple, and we're going to visit it uh, in the early evening hours. So uh, as the sun is setting, so you get the temple, um, and it's got beautiful pictures of it uh, in, uh, at the golden hour, but also it's beautifully illuminated at night. And that is the only temple that you're going to visit uh, in the evening. So um, a beautiful, um, a, a beautiful place to visit, and a wonderful time to go. Um, we go back to the boat, uh, and the next day we are going to disembark. Uh, we leave the sun boat four, and we go out to visit the Valley of the Kings. Our Valley of the Kings. There are just in the Valley of the Kings on the west bank of the Nile. There are sixty-two tombs. Um, and there are more and more that they discover. Uh, we go out where we can visit three tombs, uh, one of which will, of course, be the tomb of Tutankhamun. Uh, it's one of the um, one of the smallest tombs in the Valley of the Kings, um, and not really well decorated. I know that does not sound very appealing, but you've got to go see it. And that, that of course, is due to the fact that the king died very young, uh, and they had to uh, they had to bury him in haste. Uh, so the tomb is not fully uh, not fully constructed, uh, but again, that is it's good to see that firsthand. But the murals inside the tomb uh, are still in excellent condition. Uh, but we're not going to stop there. We will take you to more tombs. Uh, there are, like I said, there are many tombs there. They close and open at different times, so I can't promise you um, a specific tomb now. Uh, but uh, all I can tell you is the most beautiful tombs that will be open at the time will be visited. Uh, uh, from the Valley of the Kings, we go out to see the Temple of Hatshepsut, who was the uh, first female to rule Egypt. Uh, and in light of uh, the current um, news in, uh, uh, about women, um, this is um, a fascinating story to tell. When Hatshepsut ruled Egypt, uh, there was a lot of resistance because she was a woman. She portrayed herself like a man. In all of her statues, um, all of the temples, she is portrayed as a woman, but with a beard. Um, and she ruled Egypt, and she proved that as a woman, she was not only a good ruler, but she was also very, very successful. Uh, she led many expeditions down south to uh, uh, Punt, or the land of Somalia, which is now Somalia, uh, and trade expeditions that were very, very successful, very successful queen, um, and we visit her temple that is built into the mountain on the west bank of Luxor. Uh, uh, her name was, by the way, erased uh, long after uh, from some list that housed the, um, the names of all the rulers of Egypt um, about a couple hundred years later, uh, again, because she was a woman. Uh, I'm very unfortunate, but again, it's a really uh, it's a, a story to tell. Uh, from there, on the way back, we stop by what you see here, the Colosseum of Memnon, are these two statues. These um, were uh, guarding the entrance to a temple, um, or the temple of Amenhotep III. Uh, it was his mortuary temple on the west bank of the Nile. Uh, the temple was just recently discovered, uh, and there's still, as you're driving behind the statues, you will see uh, the archaeologists still digging and pulling out artifacts. 
Uh, during our visit to the West Bank, we will have a very, uh, a very special visit by an archaeologist, an active archaeologist um, on the West Bank, and he will tell us more about the uh, recent discoveries in Luxor. Um, we will go then back to um, uh, a hotel. Uh, we're going to spend the night in uh, the Hilton Luxor Hotel, which is the best hotel in all of Luxor. Uh, it's a modern hotel that was built in 2010. Uh, and you will have Nile view rooms um, at the hotel, a beautiful property. And the next day we fly to Cairo. Um, uh, and now we've all throughout the time until today, we've focused on ancient Egypt. Um, so now we focus on a different era of Egypt, the seventh century AD. Uh, so uh, uh, the Muslims conquered Egypt in 641 AD. And uh, there they built mosques. Uh, so we're going to focus on a different area and a different era of Egypt. We're going to go to the Islamic quarter of Egypt. Um, we're going to visit uh, the mosque and madrasa, which means Quranic school of Sultan Hassan. These are, this is a wonderful, uh, wonderful place to go visit. It's, it's home to not only one Quranic school, but four uh, uh, dedicated to the four schools of thought of Islam. Uh, it's also a mosque. So we visit the Quranic school and the mosque. Um, from there, we go for a walking tour. Uh, of the Khan al Salili Bazaar. Uh, so as a, it's a bazaar, so it's a market, it's an open market, you can go browse for if you'd like to do some shopping, you do there. But prior to that, we take you for a walking tour of an area right behind the bazaar uh, to see the old gates of Cairo that was built during the Fatimid times. Uh, so walk uh, through these gates, our guide explains to us about the different crafts, uh, because this area is... Um, uh, uh, it's not just for tourists. That part of the bazaar is for the Egyptians to go and shop for everyday items. So uh, he tells us about cooking. You'll see how the people, how the, how the Egyptians these days uh, go to work, what their struggles are, uh, uh, the students coming back from school, etc. Um, a very good walk to have and then free time in the bazaar if you'd like to grab a bite to eat or uh, if you'd like to do more shopping, more and more shopping. Uh, and then we go back to um, our hotel for um, some downtime, and in the evening we have a cocktail reception together, um, and um, we spend the night, and the next day is um, departure. So we'll take you in a private vehicle, a private transfer with a representative uh, back to the airport, and it doesn't matter when you come in or which day you come in, uh, we will transfer you regardless to the airport. You get a private transfer. Um, and this is really um, it in a nutshell. Our accommodation in Cairo is at the Fairmont Nile City Hotel, uh, which is a beautiful hotel about 10 minutes drive from downtown Cairo. Uh, you will have a deluxe Nile view room um, and has beautiful venues. And uh, like I said, it overlooks the Nile, a uh, beautiful view. You can't beat it. It also has a rooftop floor. So this is, the, this is really it. I will um, turn it back to Desiree now. Thanks so much, Rami. So just to give you all a quick summary of the tour, and then I'll open it up for questions, but this is an eight-day journey. Our 2018 departure leaves on November 7th. Uh, we also have a few departures in 2019, leaving on September 12th, October 22nd, and November 7th and 23rd. Um, pricing starts at $6,695 with a single supplement of $995 and an internal air cost of $685. Um, so if you have any other questions or want to find out more about this itinerary, um, you can call our call center at 855-646-0308 or visit our website. But um, if you have questions, David and Rami are here to answer your questions. So while we wait for people to ask, Rami, I think a good thing to address would be, I think a lot of people have questions about the safety of travel to Egypt. Do you want to just talk quickly about that? So uh, sure. Uh, sure. Um, so um, I'll, I'll talk about safety for a little bit, but also I'm, I'm very interested to hear uh, what David has to say uh, since he lived in Egypt and he also brings a, a very good perspective. Uh, to this. Um, in terms of your safety, Egypt has come a long way. Um, it really has been um, a, a very stable on this. Tourism comes in with um, a lot of security. Okay. Uh, so, um, like I said, it's come a long way uh, with tourism um, coming back to Egypt and pretty swiftly. The government has not only taken notice but has deployed 
um, uh, uh, tourist police um, uh, and increased tourist police presence everywhere. What a standard procedure that we would do is uh, that we would turn over um, all of our uh, travel itineraries to our tourism police department prior to your arrival. So you, they know all of our movements. Uh, uh, they have deployed, like I said, tourism police in all the archaeological sites. Every site that we go visit uh, has not only tourism police presence, but also state-of-the-art um, x-ray scanners, uh, metal detectors at all sites. Uh, and the same goes for hotels and on a cruise ship. Not only there is private security at all of these accommodations, but there's also tourism police presence. Um, most hotels, you can cannot even enter their premises without uh, the vehicles being scanned. Uh, there are uh, retractable pylons that would not um, come up until they're uh, manually um, uh, done by a, uh, a security personnel. And like I said, there are sniffer dogs, too, that uh, scan the vehicles before even approach the hotel. Um, in addition, we do have a, uh, for all groups, and that's a standard procedure, uh, there is a police escort that, um, that travels with us throughout. Um, he is uh, someone who is very friendly, that we work with uh, extensively, and uh, they, uh, they sit, we introduce them to the guests, and they sit in the back of the bus. Uh, they rarely interfere, but it, it's actually mostly the most interference is uh, if um, if you're in the market and you need help with translation. That's just about it. And to give you uh, to give you an idea, the biggest issue right now in Egypt, uh, if you open a newspaper, is whether their top player is going to uh, play in the World Cup game tomorrow. Uh, <laughs> against Uruguay, and that's the whole topic. That's what everyone's talking about now. Uh, otherwise, it's really business as usual. But I'm curious what David, uh, what, Dave, what, what David's perspective is on this. Uh, I, I would say uh, absolutely. Anywhere in the Nile Valley, you can travel with absolute confidence. It's as safe as, you know, Bethesda. Uh, I would have no concerns whatsoever. I often tell my friends and family, you're completely safe uh, as long as you stay in the Nile Valley in Egypt. There are some parts of Egypt uh, in the Sinai, uh, in some of the desert areas where security has still not been fully restored. But as I said, you know, even in 2014, uh, when things were not as stable as they are now, I happily took my in-laws uh, on a cruise through the Nile Valley with no worries whatsoever. I mean, I think there's no uh, there's no no concern about security in the slightest. I would think okay um so we have somebody type in is there a limit to the group size that's a good question um the group size is limited to a maximum number of 24 guests so and i guess and in addition um if i may if i may add um sorry desiree um, uh, um is there um in addition to the egyptologist that travels with you throughout uh, there are also helpers, uh, tour coordinators, who will help you in each stop. So when we, for example, arrive in Cairo and we fly to uh, a swan or Abu Simbel, there will be someone else helping us with the bags, helping us moving, move everything around. And I can assure you that from the moment you land, from the moment your bag arrives at the belt until you leave, you will not have to lift your bag at all, except for inside your room, of course. So there will be plenty of help everywhere. So I guess this is a good question for both of you to answer. What do you think will surprise people most about this tour? Um, David, do you want to start us off? Yeah, well, for my, my guess is just the contrast. You know, you, you go from a real third world megalopolis, you know, a, a really cosmopolitan city, which in Cairo, which has inside itself extraordinary extremes of uh, the ancient uh, and the modern of, of great wealth and sophistication and cosmopolitanism at the same time as there is poverty and conservatism. And then you go, uh, and the Nile Valley, I, I just, I can't even describe the miracle of it. I mean, you're, you know, you're, you're within sandwiched with desert on either side. You're in just this incredibly lush, uh, natural uh, jungle, it feels like at times, and it's and it's suddenly sort of clean, and the air is clear, uh, and you just feel like you're in another world. Especially when you pull up on some of these ancient temples from the water, it is truly uh, otherworldly. 
Yes, uh, yes, absolutely. I, I think, David, you're, you're spot on. The, uh, the fact that you um, have the old, new, uh, but also you have, we have you on the trip. And that's, uh, that's a, a very, very good perspective because you will hear from Egyptians uh, what they say, uh, people who live, uh, who live there, but you will also hear from David uh, on the other side of that. And that's a very exciting opportunity to hear. I, I'm sure they won't agree on everything, uh, but you will hear this discussion back and forth uh, between, um, between what David has to say and what, uh, what uh, everyday Egyptians have to say. And as you know, with Egypt, there is also very, um, it's very focused, it's in the Middle East, there is very, um, uh, fo- very strong focus on Middle Eastern media. Um, and that, that does not necessarily bring the exact, uh, the correct Western perspective. So you get that Western perspective from David firsthand. Yeah, I mean, what he's saying, to put it a little bit more bluntly, is uh, in Egypt, the government controls the media. So you only hear a fairly narrow range of opinions uh, expressed in the state or privately owned media inside Egypt. And when people come to speak to tourists, they they all say great things about their country. Uh, I love Egypt, too, um, but I have a different perspective because, of course, the New York Times is not censored. Uh, so you do you, you having me on board will probably mean you get a more diverse range of opinions. Great. And um David, we've had a few questions come in about your role on the tour. People want to know, like, will you be giving lectures and will you be with the tour throughout? So do you want to just talk about, like, your your involvement in this trip? Yeah, I've been told to prepare four talks, um, and I'm delighted to do that. Uh, I believe I'll be around the whole time, so I'm, I'm as available as much as you like, and I promise not to bore you. <laughs> I'm sure you won't. <laughs> Um, we've got a lot of questions rolling in. Um, we have a question here about how to dress in Egypt um, and also what weather to expect. Okay, um, I can address that. Um, so our departures are positioned during, um, during the um, fall and um, winter seasons. Uh, at that time, the temperature, the average high is 70, um, average low is 50. Now, that's average. Obviously, it fluctuates. Uh, but what you would wear is, the, the advice I would tell you is layer, layer, layer. Um, the weather can change, although it rarely rains in Egypt. Uh, when it rains, it pours. Uh, but I would not really worry about that part, uh, the rain part, because like I said, it, I, I've lived in Egypt um uh, until 2003, um, uh, and I, I can remember the rain uh, maybe nine, ten times. Uh, so you don't have to worry about that. Uh, what I can tell you is it's a conservative country, um, not very conservative. So um, you can still uh, just covering arms and legs during the visit to the mosques, especially on the last day. Uh, but otherwise, uh, uh, if you cover your knees, uh, so um, uh, long shorts, uh, pants, uh, 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 sleeveless, sh- sleeveless shirts are perfectly acceptable, except for the days that you visit mosques. Hats, sun cream are an absolute must, and good walking shoes. Um, and we just had another question come in, uh, asking if there will be other passengers on the Nile boat, or will it be exclusive to our journey? That's a very good question. Um, and the quick answer to this is there will be the other passengers on the ship, but uh, all of your activities on the ship, uh, all of the sightseeing, short excursions, if you will, are all private to the New York Times groups. And so will the lectures be that will be conducted by David. These are exclusive to the, this group of the New York Times travelers. David, could you talk a little bit about the recent election in Egypt and the political future of the country? Um, just your thoughts on that. Uh, sure. Um, the, the elections under the current government aren't really elections in the kind that we're familiar with the West, where there's a real choice of candidates. It's more like a plebiscite or even a pageant. Uh, I don't think there was any suspense whatsoever about the re-election of President Abdel Fattah Sisi. Uh, in fact, there's some noises now about changing the constitution so that he can remain in power after his two terms uh, and become once again a president for life. So you're not visiting Egypt at a time when political freedom uh, or freedom of expression is at its peak. Uh, that said, you know, it's, it's a stable time, I think. Uh, as I say, in the Nile Valley, 
uh, doesn't look like uh, any unrest is a factor, and it doesn't look like any change is imminent for the time being. Uh, for somebody like me who lived through the excitement of the Arab Spring, this is a little bit disappointing. Uh, for Rami, uh, who's more focused on the tourist industry, I think it's reassuring to see Egypt uh, return to stability uh, and be open for business. Uh, looking ahead to the future, I think uh, it's not clear uh, how change is going to come to Egypt. Uh, economically, the country is going to be under growing pressure uh, in the coming years. Um, it has benefited from quite a bit of generosity from uh, the oil-rich Persian Gulf states, uh, and that is likely to dry up as the price of oil puts pressure on them. At the same time, the Egyptian population continues to grow, uh, and so there's a need to keep creating new jobs at really a very high rate. Uh, and the economy, they're struggling to get to the kind of energetic uh, free enterprise that we're familiar with in the West. They're having a little bit of trouble shaking the state uh, or a kind of oligopolistic uh, uh, grip uh, on the economy. Uh, and they're going to have to deal with that. Uh, in the years ahead. That may be more than you wanted to know, but that's the prognosis. Great, that's really interesting. Um, cool. Uh, Rami, could you answer this question? Uh, are we traveling to the Sinai area in this tour? Uh, no, we will not be traveling to the Sinai area. Um, our areas of focus will be uh, the northern side of Egypt, which is uh, Cairo and uh, the suburbs of, of Cairo and Giza. And we've fly south to Aswan and Abu Simbel and Luxor. Uh, and that's where the itinerary travels. Uh, Sinai is, um, um, and I can, I can appreciate um, uh, why the question is being asked. Uh, there is, it's, not, uh, it's not very stable up north in the Sinai, but we will not be going anywhere near that area. Okay. Um, you know, if I can add something to that, you know, you read a lot in the newspaper about the troubles in the North Sinai. The area where the troubles in the North Sinai are is actually very small. I mean, for sure, it is not safe to go there. They wouldn't let us go there. They certainly wouldn't let me go there as a journalist. But by the same token, it's actually a relatively tiny corner of Egypt where all that trouble is happening. Great. Um, so I'll just take one more question off of the list now. Um, someone has asked, do you recommend trying to add more days in Cairo are there going to be things that they'll miss on this tour? Um, I can answer this. Um, the, the, of course, there's is, there is so much to see, um, and in Cairo specifically, um, there are there. Are, if your um, if your main interest is uh, history and archaeology, uh, you will not be disappointed if you add on more days. So there are other pyramids that you could go visit. Uh, there's a pyramid called the Ben Pyramid, which was a stepping stone between the um, a step pyramid and also the Great Pyramid. Uh, so you can visit the Bent Pyramid and the Pyramid of Saqqara. There are other museums that you can go visit. Uh, there's another area that I highly recommend that I'm very passionate about, uh, given my background, is uh, Coptic Cairo. You go visit a different side of Egypt, which is the Coptic Quarter. Um, the Coptic Quarter is uh, the Christian part of Egypt. Uh, so like I said before, Christianity was introduced in Egypt by St. Mark the Apostle. And uh, monasticism started in Egypt and the Western desert of Egypt. Uh, and uh, so this is a completely different side of Egypt where you learn about uh, uh, ancient Christendom and uh, the spreading of Christianity, how Egypt influenced Western Christianity as it is structured these days. So the quick answer is, yes, certainly there is so much more to see in Egypt and in Cairo specifically. Fantastic. Um, well, I'm going to wrap it up now since we're about out of time. Um, just a reminder that if people do have more questions about the itinerary, uh, our reservation specialist at our call center would be more than happy to answer them for you. You can also, again, visit our website and you can see the complete itinerary and submit questions there if you'd like. Um, thank you so much to David and Rami for joining us today. We hope to see you on a time's journey soon. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Thanks a lot.